It's the M62 at the scene of a crash, causing long queues back onto the M62. And on the M1 in Leicestershire, the left lane is closed northbound. Junction 20 to 21 towards Leicester. There's been a collision just south of the M69, adding about a quarter of an hour onto your journey. Big problems in central London tonight. All approaches to Parliament Square are blocked because of an ongoing demonstration. Police are at the scene. Long queues through Waterloo, back over Lambeth Bridge and the IMAX roundabout. Pimlico and Vauxhall also very congested. In Wiltshire, the A30 at Salisbury is closed following a gas leak and on London Underground no service on the Metropolitan Line Wembley Park to all gates with severe delays on the rest of the line and that's the latest You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, Text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Day two of the NatCon conference in Brussels did happen. Yes, a big ruling in the Belgian courts overnight and a huge victory, I think, for free speech. Rwanda ping pong continues to go on between the Commons and the House of Lords. Tonight is the night that the Lords are supposed to fold. But what if they don't? What would that mean for the government's legislation? And the Enough is Enough march. Victims of financial crime and fraud meet together in London, march, and basically say, look, there are people who are victims here who are being treated by HMRC as if they were criminals. All of that and much more after the news with Polly Middlehurst. Nigel, thanks very much indeed and good evening to you. Well, the top story from the GB Newsroom tonight, as you've been hearing, peers have been urged to stop opposing the government's Rwanda bill after MPs again rejected demands for change from the House of Lords. It is in the upper chamber right now. If you're watching on television, you can see... Um, uh, the peers discussing that right now. Home Office Minister Michael Tomlinson earlier saying, though, the Lords uh, need to allow that bill to pass now to send a clear signal that if you come to the United Kingdom uh, illegally, you should not be able to, set, uh, to stay. Uh, once again, peers mulling over those rejected amendments. Ms Chakrabarty there in the centre of your screen giving her opinion on that. She's been uh, quite a strong opposer of the government's flagship policy so far. Meanwhile, in a new development, the Home Office has confirmed the government is now considering a new deal with Vietnam 
to tackle illegal migration following reports that accommodation that had been earmarked for migrants in Rwanda has already been sold on because of the delay to the bill. The Prime Minister has meanwhile committed to getting flights off the ground to Rwanda by the end of spring. Now, in other news today, Sir Keir Starmer has accused the Prime Minister of dodging questions over cutting NHS or state pension funding to cover the cost of eventually scrapping national insurance. Speaking during Prime Minister's questions, the Labour leader criticised the Conservatives for what he called their obsession with unfunded tax cuts. But Rishi Sunak said, it's always the same with Labour, with higher taxes and working people paying the price. Well, the Prime Minister also hailed today today's inflation figures, saying they demonstrate that his economic plan is working. Figures indeed show the rate of inflation has fallen to its lowest level in two and a half years, down to 3.2% in March compared with 3.4% in February. Economists are saying it's a dip in food prices that's the main reason for that slowdown. A 28-year-old man convicted of attempting to murder two elderly worshippers at mosques in what a judge has described as a horrific attack has been sentenced to an indefinite hospital order. Mohammed Abkir, who has paranoid schizophrenia, threw petrol over his victims and set them on fire outside mosques in Birmingham and in London. The court heard 82-year-old Hashi Odoa and 70-year-old Mohammed Rayaz were chosen at random because, Abkir believed, they were possessed by evil spirits. And in one note on some international news for you, the Israeli Prime Minister has told our Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, that Israel will be making its own decisions about how to defend itself as global leaders pleaded for restraint from him over how to respond to those Iranian drone and missile attacks at the weekend. Foreign Secretary speaking face-to-face -face with Benjamin Netanyahu and admitting that more should be done to sanction Tehran. Rishi Sunak, of course, speaking to his Israeli counterpart on the phone last night in a delayed call from Number 10, saying significant escalation is in no-one's interest, also telling Mr Netanyahu it would only deepen insecurity in the Middle East. The boss of the post office today was exonerated following an independent investigation into allegations of bullying. Nick Reed always rejected claims of misconduct. The firm says it has now its full backing to lead the organisation, which continues to fall under the spotlight over the Horizon IT scandal, in which hundreds of sub-postmasters were wrongly convicted of fraud. That's the news. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com alerts. Well, after yesterday's drama in Brussels and the closure order for the NatCon conference, we went out afterwards for a drink and a bite to eat, and literally we did not know would day two of NatCon happen. Now, we'd already seen, of course, uh, Maloney of Italy speak out, the Belgian Prime Minister, even the British Prime Minister. Um, so we sort of felt, well, you know, maybe something will happen. Well, it did. There was some dramatic legal action that took place through the night, and we'll go into that. And this morning, the conference happened and the star of the day was the Hungarian Prime Minister, one Viktor Orban, who took to the stage. Uh, I was pleased to have a chat with him. And, you know, I must say, he gave a very, very strong defence of Christian values and of Western values and why it's the nation-state that should deal with issues like immigration, not supranational structures like the European Union. So that was really, really good. But the hero of all of this is the owner of the club, Claridge, the club. He, you know, they even towed his car away yesterday. They stopped the caterers getting into the premises. He was told on the phone, if this conference continues, we will ruin your business. And this Tunisian businessman withstood the blooming lot. And without him, there is no question, NatCon would have been over virtually before it had even begun. And I was very pleased to have a chat with him earlier on this morning. I think that uh, yesterday we have a marked difference and real change uh, for the future in consideration of the debate, debate, politic debate uh, between all uh, constituents of the politic uh, 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 party. 
and uh, I think that uh, we have opened uh, to a new space mm. uh, for discussion mm. and uh, new opportunity for all to participate on a political debate. So, there he was, Mr Ben, as I've abbreviated his name to, and I've got to tell you, he's not actually naturally a Conservative himself. He just believes in open debate and free speech, which I think is terrific. He's a very brave man, he's done well. I hope his business in Brussels absolutely flourishes as a result of what he's done. But what he was hinting at there, he was saying, you know, maybe something has changed as a result of this, and I think he may be right. Is this a watershed moment? Well, tell you what, for some time now, those on the hard left say cancel culture, it doesn't exist. It's a figment of the imagination of the libertarians. Well, I tell you what, the whole world, the whole world could see that cancel culture was alive and kicking in Brussels yesterday. And you know, headlines today in the New York Times, I'm going on Fox News later on this evening, this story has gone global. So the first reason why I believe it is a watershed moment is that now it cannot be denied that this sort of thing happens. And the second reason why it's a watershed moment, it's going to be very much more difficult in future to cancel speakers going to universities, to cancel meetings being held by truly legitimate organisations. I'm not saying the whole thing's finished, I'm not saying the war is over, but we have won an important battle. And it is, folks, believe me, a turning point, and I'm very proud to have been a part of it. Let me know your thoughts. Is this a watershed moment? Farage at GB News. Com. Now, GB News' Charlie Peters was there yesterday and today and summed up the proceedings overnight. The National Conservatism Conference is running on day two, despite a threat from the local mayor to shut down the event, having deployed police to this conference hall yesterday. And as I leave the venue, this is something that I could not have done yesterday, because if you left, you would not have been allowed to be readmitted into the venue. Now, these speeches have gone ahead today. We've heard from the Prime Minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban, and people on the street in Brussels told me that they were disappointed by this political censorship. We are in a free country and everybody can say whatever he wants. Yeah. Do you think that Even the... if I don't agree with them, but we are a free country, so that's all that I can say. You think he made a mistake then to make that order? Yes, I think he made a mistake. Yeah. It's not even a democracy. If I can't say what I want to say, we are not in a democracy anymore. Uh, that they should have done is not good. Not good? No, it's not good. Uh, that they should uh, keep it uh, like this because the, the mayor was against it. But there's no reason because everybody has his opinion. So why, uh, why, why shut it down? Yeah. Actually, here in Belgium, we have like a censorship, like we call it uh, the um, uh, cordon sanitaire, which actually means that the far right parties are forbidden in the um, uh, news media. Yeah. Sorry for my English, it's really bad. So, yeah, uh, I have seen like one or two videos of it uh, with the police and with a um, um, member of the Flemish parliament, uh, uh, right wing extremists, yeah, and with Zemmour, but I don't have uh, any further information of it. A Tunisian businessman stepped in to allow this club to host the event after two previous venues cancelled under pressure. He then stood firm after receiving several threats calling on him to drop the conference. Day two of the conference only went ahead after an overnight legal challenge pushed back against the mayor's orders. And despite all of this, very few leading voices in the EU have come out in favour of free speech and against the mayor's ban. Charlie Peters, GB News, Brussels. And Charlie does raise a very important point there, which is the Vlaams parties, which are Flemish nationalist parties, separatist parties that want to leave Belgium. Uh, the cordon sanitaire means basically they get no press coverage whatsoever in Belgium and they often struggle to hold events. What was really interesting this morning was Viktor Orban said at the start, I grew up in the Soviet Union. In 1988, we founded Fidesz in Hungary, still part of the Soviet Empire. And time and again, he said, we would book meeting rooms to have events, only to have them cancelled. And he reminded us that modern-day Brussels now genuinely has shades of that old 
Soviet Union. And that's a very serious point. Are you listening in, front bench of the Labour Party? Because you seem to approve of us being cancelled yesterday. Now, overnight, the legal eagles were very, very busy, and I'm pleased to say that I'm joined by Lorcan Price, Irish barrister and legal counsel for the Alliance Defending Freedom International, which is, Lorcan, a faith-based group... That's correct. ..that intervened and helped the organisers of NatCon overnight. What happened? Well, it, what happened was, after it became clear that one of our speakers, Paul Coleman, a colleague of mine, was being prevented from entering, um, we were as shocked as the, uh, the, the organisers of NatCon to see this line of police appear outside the venue. Um, and uh, we obtained then a copy of the order from this municipal mayor. Yep. Um, he was being called the mayor of Brussels, but we shouldn't give him a, a title beyond <laughs> that he deserves. Although the mayor of Brussels had helped cancel the first <laughs> That venue, is absolutely correct, yeah. yeah. And, and we'll get to that in a second because there's more to be said about that. Um, but once we looked at the order, it was clearly totally disproportionate. Um, what it essentially came down to was he didn't like uh, the gathering because it included people people who, and I quote, were Eurosceptic and traditionalist, Good among day. other things. How ghastly. So, um, in order to protect you from yourselves, he decided there was a public order threat and he was going to close it down. But he never weighed any other considerations in the balance, such as freedom of expression, freedom of association. Um, so, my colleagues moved quickly then to take this case into the Conseil d'État, which is the, 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 the highest administrative court in Belgium, in order to get uh, an emergency hearing to overturn this order and I'm glad to say that they were able to get that case on at 10pm and the decision then was made late into the night and then, as yeah, we see, it was issued. 2.30 in the morning the judge gave the ruling. That's correct, yes, yes. So uh, it shows you that justice can be responsive yeah. when it needs to be um, and it shows you as well, uh, despite I think legitimate criticisms that we would have of courts very often, when push came to shove they did take the human rights considerations into balance so that, that was very good to hear. And um, it also means as well that I think, and this is a point that Conservatives ought to remember um, these human rights provisions exist in law and we should use them so long as we have the opportunity to use them because they won't be there necessarily forever. Um, we, we've seen all kinds of threats in the past to rescind them and uh, so long as they're there um, we should try and ensure that they act in a way that is fair to everybody. So it doesn't matter what side of the political spectrum you're on, you should yeah. be able to have the right to freedom of association oh, yeah. and expression. Yeah, I mean, with or without human rights, uh, this actually should be a God-given freedom that we're born with, frankly. Absolutely, you know. absolutely. Uh, and you mentioned the first, the, the, the big mayor of Brussels, mm. Mr Close. What was his involvement in yes, all this? Yes, well, I mean, there were two other venues that cancelled before it came to this point. So I'm told Brussels has something like 19 mayors, but yeah. the, the big boss in the yeah. centre, he put pressure, uh, as far as we're aware at this point, on the first venue, which is the, the venue I actually spoke at two years ago when I spoke at uh, NatCon, um, Concert Nobile. Then things moved to the Sofitel, and they came under yeah. significant pressure as well. Yeah. And I think there's more to be said about who was pressuring them. I've heard rumours about that there were quite senior politicians, even from the European Union, who were pressuring them. Now, we don't know yet, but it, it Well, the out. mayor of the district hmm. that the Sofitel was in is a member of the same political party as my old friend Guy Verhofstadt. Well, I'm not so surprised. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised in the mm. least if he wasn't involved yeah. in some way. This, so, this genuinely went global in the most extraordinary way. Yes. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that GB News was absolutely in the forefront, covering the whole thing live and very, very exciting. Getting back to Mr Ben and mm -hmm. the comments that I made a few minutes ago, is this, could this be a watershed moment? I think there's a strong possibility it is. I, the, the spectacle of seeing some minor bureaucrat being able to deploy the riot police, armed troops essentially, uh, because the Belgian police are, are, are all armed, uh, to create this, this cordon sanitaire, this line to prevent people from entering a venue. Totally mainstream speakers yourself, Suella Braverman, academics like Yoram and uh, John O'Sullivan and my colleague yeah. Paul Coleman, um, talking about very mainstream conservative topics that millions of people across Europe support to say that they are so toxic that we need to actually use the strong arm of the state, the police, to stop that from happening. I, I, I think it's absolutely extraordinary. And you've, you've been through a situation yourself, of course, where we've seen cancellation by private organisations, banks yeah. or venues. Yeah, and we've yeah. also heard through this. It's a different... I'm an expert. Well, yeah, indeed you are. <laughs> it's, it's a different level, I think, uh, of seriousness where the, the police are deployed in that mm. kind of way. And so I think the optics of that really have struck home for that reason. Yeah, I do. Uh, well, let's hope mm. uh, that in future, as I said, no one can deny the existence of cancel culture. I think we've dealt with that. Correct pretty effectively. Uh, and all I can say really to you guys, to you and your team in Brussels is terrific job you did.
in supporting NatCon, winning that legal action during the middle of the night, and the conference went ahead. And I tell you what, the whole thing is a huge victory for free speech, isn't it? I think it absolutely is. Yeah, good day, really, really good day. I'm delighted. In a moment, we will cross to the Palace of Westminster. Let's find out what is going on with the game of parliamentary ping pong over Rwanda. And will the House of Lords do what everyone expects them to do, which means fold this evening? Because I'm just not so sure. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. The Princess of Wales is now officially the most popular royal. This is a YouGov poll that found that over 75% of people have a positive view of Princess Catherine, with Prince William only slightly behind his wife at 73%. Uh, Cameron Walker, a royal correspondent, is here uh, with this one, what would you what would you read into that, and as to why? Well, I think it's hardly surprising. Since the start of the year, the Princess of Wales's popularity is up six points with the British public, according to this YouGov poll. And obviously, at the start of the year, she went into hospital for abdominal surgery and has subsequently been diagnosed with cancer and is undergoing surgery. Look, the Princess of Wales, since becoming a, a member of the royal family, has committed no major faux pas. There's been no particular scandal with yeah. her. She always puts family first, and I hate the phrase born a commoner but she wasn't born into aristocracy uh, she was not born into the royal family she gave up her old old life and yes that comes with lots of privilege being a member of the royal family but it also comes with enormous challenges such as everybody prying into your private life particularly when it comes to your health and I think the British public are very much on side with that whereas Prince Harry and Meghan continue to be unpopular 76 compared to 31 percent having a positive opinion of uh, Prince Harry, and only 26%, 50 points less, than Princess Catherine is Meghan. Yes, still not looking great for Harry and Meghan. Prince Andrew is even below, is far below them as well. Doing well on uh, negative views, meaning fewer people have negative views about her than anyone else, is the Princess Royal, Princess Anne. Indeed, yes. The most hard-working royal, if you go by the number of engagements she carries out each year. No nonsense, no fuss. She never gets herself into any kind of uh, arguments or scandals. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Some of your thoughts on what happened in Brussels yesterday and today. One viewer says, it is one of the biggest ever examples of cancel culture and one that has even seen people on the left comment how bad it is. Yes, Owen Jones made some comments like that earlier. And Peter says, I think it is a watershed moment. I want to know who was really behind trying to shut the conference down apart from the mayor. Yeah, well, I did speculate earlier on about the political party of Guy Verhofstadt. I can't say it was him. But I thought the point that Charlie Peters made, that almost nobody in the European Union was critical of what happened, tells you an awful lot. I was there, folks, for 20 years and seven months. And I promise you, no alternative opinion is tolerated. Right to the Palace of Westminster and Christopher Hope, GB News's political editor, as the game of parley, parliamentary ping pong continues. So, as I understand it, Chris, the Commons have now sent it all back to the Lords. 
Yes, evening, uh, Nigel, from this historic uh, thousand-year-old Westminster Hall. This is uh, how politics works, not in Brussels, but in Westminster, where the House of Commons decide to do things and the Lords can ask the Commons to think again. That's happened three times so far. This afternoon, there were four attempts to, to amend or weaken, if the government, in the government's view, the safety of Rwanda bill. That, those are, uh, those uh, measures went back to the House of Lords. As we speak, peers are now speaking, discussing three amendments to send back to the House of Commons from Lord Hope, the former judge, Lord Brown, the former Labour Defence Secretary, and Baroness Chakrabart, the former Head of Liberty. These will, these will look at trying to ensure that it must be declared a safe country by an independent monitoring body, that migrants fleeing Afghanistan, where they're fought with UK forces, won't be sent to Rwanda. And Baroness Chakrabarti's one is about individual claims, which could tie the whole thing up in knots for years. That's what's happening right now. We'll find out whether, firstly, whether the Lords put this to a vote. That's not certain. We know that we know the Labour peers will vote for these measures, but will the crossbenchers support them? And will that be enough to get it over the line? It seems like they, they may get through. And if that happens, Nigel, you won't be surprised to hear, you've been saying it all week, it means it won't become law tomorrow, the safety of Rwanda yeah. bill, and will go forward into another week. More delay, as you were, you were speculating on, I think, when we last spoke about this yesterday, more delay to this. But we have heard today from a former Border Force expert saying he thinks the flights will take off in June if this, is may, if this, this bill becomes law in short order. And the idea that the whips had, it would have been they targeted tomorrow. That now m may not happen if the laws get their way tonight. Yeah, well, Chris, as you say, we're still speculating. I've just, I've just had this feeling since Monday that we've got a very rebellious House of Lords, a government towards the fag end of 14 years, and if they ever wanted to really kick up rough, now is a big moment to do it. Thank you. And, by the way, do give me the telephone number of the Border Force guy, because I do want to have a £10 bet with him. Any more drama, Chris? Come back to us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Indeed. Now, with the Albanians in particular, who were coming into the UK in very, very large quantities last year, I did show you a series of TikTok adverts and images. Well, someone's done the work of putting all this together. It's Zach Garner-Perkis, Investigations Editor of Express.co.uk. Welcome back. Thank you. On the programme. Let's begin showing something that you've put together from a guy called Alex Vischer, who is a big-time criminal, but almost a celebrity now on TikTok, isn't he? Well, I mean, what we found was, or what we exposed, was essentially just an absolute... Just bra brazen criminality mm. just on TikTok, on Instagram, and going back years as well. So we're talking about wanted posters yeah. for, for, for people that have supposedly rubbed Rob drug farms. Yeah. And, and here he is now on our telly, and, and some of the language uh, that is being used is pretty vile. Um, but this guy and his brother have made fortunes out of cannabis farms in the UK. There he is boasting up to 2,300 cannabis plants every couple of months. I mean, the remarkable thing about this, right, which is... To us, this is shocking. But over there, if you speak to particularly young people, they'll say, OK, UK cannabis farms. This is just, like, common knowledge to every person in the street. And the, uh, the thought is, if you go to the UK, you can make a fortune from yeah. just sitting in a house. Well, and you sat down and interviewed one of these guys. Let's, let's have a look um, at some of those video clips on the screen for our viewers. Uh, really, really interesting, because what he was saying... Basically, what he was saying is that. Yeah, let, let's uh, let's let's have a look um, at this sit down between Zach uh, and this drug lord. These videos don't just show drug production facilities; they also provide details about how these farms operate and the money that can be earned by workers and growers. <laughs> There you go, five to six thousand quid a month, and here you are sitting down with the drug lord. Social media not only influenced Loku to travel to Britain illegally, it's also provided the method for him to get there. <laughs> 
Këtë e kam një ofë të numërin, e kam një ofë në rejtë social në TikTok, që më nga njësë dhe shoko, shkuj, i kam shkuj, në kalla në numërin, aty taksia i kam të regu se gjithë dhe gjanë nga Belgjika. His story was corroborated by a people trafficker we tracked down, who boasted about making posts that immediately went viral on social media. Jo, për momentin, du më thënë, unë kam hapë... Me gomone për Angli, e ja do njësëm i nesër, a kuptonë, thjesht gënjej bre, po... Well, great work, Zach. You know, you're finding those that have come as a result of the adverts and those that are organising the whole thing. I also read in the notes, they're told if the police raid, say, claim the Modern Slavery Act. Well, actually, that's remarkable, because that was actually one of the videos that was flying around on TikTok, which has uh, advice for if you're in a cannabis farm and you yeah. get raided, what to, what to say. Been viewed hundreds of thousands of times, was posted years ago, it's, it's just all been up there and nobody has been doing anything about we it. We have a police force. We have a border force. What are they doing, Zach? Well, but this is the thing of, like, social media. It's that, like, that they just don't seem... There's, well, there's certain parts of social media that they want to police and then there's brazen criminality, which all of a sudden that exists in this kind of invisible spot that, like, nobody's able to happen. But, like, these things are clearly... They're just they're laughing in the face yeah. of of the police and and the, the beneficiaries. The beneficiary, apart from the criminals, the beneficiaries, of course, are Meta, that owns Instagram, and TikTok because they're making money off the back of this, aren't they? Well, this is the remarkable thing about some of these influencers that we found out in Albania that are say they're promoting a criminal lifestyle in the UK. Um, TikTok is taking basically way it works is people tip them, so they send them. Yeah. A bit of money, TikTok takes 50% of that. So they are directly making money from it. With uh, Meta, Instagram, we know they like to keep people on their platforms, whatever means, mm. whether it's promoting drug farms or, you know, looking at what moves to do in the gym. Like, they don't mind. And it's just it's wild that it's just been going on like this under the noses of everyone. I mean, I couldn't believe it, like, how long these things have been up no. there for and that no. I'm one of the first people to kind of bring this to attention because I've not seen it any, but anywhere else. Well, we've tried on this programme to occasionally do things, but you've drawn the strings of all this together and done it very, very well. And don't forget, folks, who is paid 15 million quid a year working for Meta? What's his name? Uh, I think his name is Sinek Clay. Yes, there you are. Yeah. But, but no joy from him. Well, so one of the things that we wanted to do, and I would encourage everyone to, you know, go to the Express YouTube and watch the video for yourself so you can get the, yep. the full story on yep. this one. Um, but we wanted to kind of put a face to it. So we've, we've got a guy who we spoke to an ex-police officer and said, you know, we've got someone that understands Britain, understands British laws, and he's at the top of Meta. Mm. And, well, when we went to go and find it, we asked him for an interview. We didn't get a response to that. So, you know, I went and knocked on his door, didn't get a response to that. So, look, Nick, if you're watching... Yeah, yeah absolutely. The, the, it's still, we're still open. Very, Explain very good. Explain why you got that stuff on your platform. Zach, great work. Thanks ever so much for coming on again. And, folks, express.co.uk is where you need to go to see more of Zach's work. A TikTok spokesman said they work closely with UK law enforcement, the National Crime Agency and aid organisations to fight this industry-wide issue and they have a strictly maintained zero tolerance approach to human exploitation. Meta said buying, selling or soliciting drugs is not allowed on our platforms. When we find content coordinating this illegal activity, we remove it from our platforms. And the Home Office said, ah, here we go. The UK and Albanian authorities have a close working partnership. Mm. And we take every opportunity to intercept criminals and speed up the removal of those with no legal right to be in the UK. Well, that's all well and good, but they're not just coming in via the channel, folks. They're coming in in the back of lorries as well. In a moment, an important story. A march together uh, today put on in London called Enough is Enough, and it's about victims of financial crime, some of whom are getting treated by HMRC as if they were criminals themselves. Time for your latest weather update from the Met Office here on GB News. Good evening. Temperatures dropping away tonight. It's going to be a cold start tomorrow. Much of the south will stay fine, but further north, some rain and cloud moving in, thanks to this little area of low pressure that's drifting south. Ahead of that, we've had a couple of weather fronts bringing some rain today, particularly for Northern Ireland. That's now spreading south across parts of Pembrokeshire, Devon and Cornwall, but clearing through this evening. 
Further showers across eastern England, they'll steadily fade as well. And where we've got the clear skies, southern Scotland, northwest England, Wales, a hint of blue on the chart, suggesting there will be a frost, certainly in the countryside. Most towns and cities just about staying above freezing, but certainly a, a chilly start to Thursday. For many, a bright sunny start. There could be some showers early on across Kent. They should fade, but rain will creep into uh, the highlands of Scotland, the Western Isles first thing, and that'll spread across most of Scotland by lunchtime. Parts of the north and east of Northern Ireland seeing some rain and through the afternoon turning damp over Northern England and North Wales. But much of the south will stay dry and bright. We could reach 15 in London, a brighter day across East Anglia. Cooler further north with the winds picking up and those brisk winds, then a feature of the weather on Friday as well. Friday, broadly speaking, a mixture of sunshine and showers, a duller day across the southeast and a, a much wetter day across East Anglia compared to tomorrow. Feeling chilly again with that wind, much of Northern Ireland, Scotland having a drier day, uh, but still on the fresh side, 8 to 14 degrees. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Tom Harwood. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. There are far too many victims of financial fraud and crime in this country, and very often they form together their own little groups. Well, today, something remarkable happened. They came together as one big collective group and did a march under the banner, Enough is Enough, and GB News' Adam Cherry was there to find out what happened. That's right, Nigel, yeah, so it was, it was a big march today, actually. I, I was surprised, I think some of the people there were surprised by how many people were there. And the important thing to say about this is, this is it's organised by the Transparency Task, Task Force. It's not just one or two groups over a specific in, issue like pension fraud or investment fraud, it's all of them together. Uh, because they've realised that their voice is more powerful in that way yeah. and uh, more likely to, to get noticed as it has done today. So um, it started outside the Royal Courts of Justice. I spoke to the leader of the task force, a man called uh, Andy Agathangelo, and uh, this is what he had to say when he was explaining why he was here and what he's hoping for out of uh, today's marches. Let's take a look at this. But this is so important, Adam, because today's meeting isn't about any one individual campaign organisation. What makes this wonderful gathering different is that everybody has learned that individually the campaign groups are not strong enough. We're all coming together. We all know that enough is enough, and that's why we're doing what we're doing today. We're campaigning for justice, specifically we're campaigning for people who've been harmed as a direct consequence of financial misconduct, regulatory failure, egregious misconduct by various institutions. Enough is enough, Adam. We're here to try and sort it out. So, as you see, an, an impassioned speech strong there. Stuff, yeah. Very strong. And uh, actually, I spoke to him uh, just before the camera rolled. He was talking about a chap called Ian, who was a member of uh, this, this task force, knew, uh, knew Andy a little bit. And unfortunately, he uh, took his own life 
in the last few months because of pressure mm. from uh, from the authorities, and, and he'd lost all his money, and there was no sympathy. And, um, and he was just a lawnmower salesman. I say just, but you know, there mm. was some. Often when you see these sorts of scandals, it's high-profile people, mm. footballers, and so on. And actually, there are some of those there today. But uh, Ian's story was was telling because he, it, this can happen to anyone. It's the common man story. So um, March continue. We went along to the Treasury, and they were carrying. As I say, it's going all through central London. They were carrying the coffin. Uh, of what represented the uh, victims of the suicides. Yeah. So there's lots of... Uh, I see that. Yeah, exactly. As you see there, there's the footage. Um, and so those re that represents those who have been lost, and they placed it outside HMRC's uh, head office uh, this afternoon before heading to Parliament and Downing Street. There you, so, there you see the, the image for those watching mm. on television. Mm. Uh, as I said, I spoke to some of the more high-profile people as well. I spoke to Craig Shaw, who is a former... Uh, he's an ex-professional footballer and Premier League football. Premier League yeah he used to play for Everton in the 90s yeah um, and he I, I asked him why he was here was he had he been affected by this it turns out he hadn't but it's a common problem uh, for footballers to get involved in this sort of thing and this is what he had to say hoping for reform you know it's it, for, I've heard stories there of people have been fighting this for 20 years groups have been fighting for 20 years people have passed away from natural causes I've mentioned the suicides of course um, and the, the momentum's building um, we're all looking people to look at the information look at the evidence um, a chap in the, in the meeting there in the press conference said that fraud accounted for 40 40 percent of reported crime in this country and I think eight percent gets solved so that's an absolute disgrace it's a national scandal and on behalf of our group and all the other groups I've been marching with today, we need that needs looking into. Presumably, you know, we, we have the FCA, we have regulatory authorities. Mm. Um, it, it seems the biggest complaint these groups have got is really against them and HMRC as well. That's right, yeah, there's a, there's a general feeling that this... One, that there's not under-resourced, but also when the likes of HMRC get in touch with... Uh, under-resourced in respect to, you know, helping those... Yeah. helping combat scams. But once all that happens and they're, they're now being investigated themselves, uh, it, HMRC uh, are allegedly very bullish. You know, they send letter after letter after letter. Um, when you need help from them, it's very difficult. When you're in trouble, uh, they get in touch with you very, very easily. Yes, yeah, so I mean, you could receive a large lump sum of money. Yeah. Uh, you haven't got to pay tax on it for six months or whatever. You put some of the money into an investment. You get defrauded. You've lost your money, but you still get a tax bill. Yeah. So I spoke to a, uh, a barrister today at the press conference who's doing work for these guys pro bono, and he said, yeah, you know, you, you have money stolen, and then you're taxed for income you never received. And it, what are you supposed to do? The, yeah, I mean, other countries would treat people in this position as victims, mm. but the HMRC assumption seems to be that people are guilty, and it's up to them to prove their innocence. Adam, when, I mean, it's obviously very impressive that this has been put together mm. today and, and well done to the Transparency Task Force. And I get the argument they're stronger together than being little individual yeah. groups. But where does this go from here? Well, that's the question. And so, so their plan at the moment is to get a statutory public inquiry, to at least get the ball rolling, to understand a little bit like the, the sub-postmasters scandal. Mm, mm, so mm. It, it's, it's incrementally little bits and pieces. We do more and more on this. I say we, you know, they and the media attention on this. Through public scrutiny, perhaps leads to a more substantial outcome further down the road. They're not expecting magic overnight because that would be unrealistic. Um, but it, it's, it's an incremental process that starts with things like this, I think. Interesting. Adam, thank you very much indeed. Now, my What the Farage moment of the day. We've been hearing a lot of stories recently about fraud, particularly on Universal Credit. We showed the Bulgarian gang that had ripped 50 million quid out of the system. Um, and I have to say that having powers, the Department of Work and Pensions, having powers to check into people's bank accounts and assets to make sure they're not being defrauded, on the face of it, I think, is a good thing. However, and this is worrying, there is an amendment coming into government legislation that would allow the DWP to access bank statements, bank accounts, which, after all, aren't just financial transactions. They also say, well, you've travelled to and many other things that you've done, that would allow them to access it for anybody in receipt of DWP money. And that will, of course, include every pensioner in the country. Now, you know, I have to say that I'm not surprised that Big Brother Watch say it is breathtaking that a Conservative government 
is so recklessly creating Big Brother star spying powers to intrude on the population's bank accounts. And this worries me. It almost links back to Adam's story in a sense, that once again it's about financial institutions, it's about their relationship with the government. Um, and, and I have to say, I, I really think someone in Parliament needs to stand up and shout because government just gets bigger and bigger. Its ability to intrude into our lives and indeed to interfere in our lives gets greater and greater for, frankly, not much good at all. Now, a Department for Work and Pension spokesman said, Big Brother watches claims that DWP will use these measures to reveal information about people's movements, opinions and medical information are entirely false. The government remains committed to these powers as a method of reducing fraud and error in the benefit system, which will save the taxpayer £600 million over the next five years. There you go, folks. You pays your money, you takes your choice. If you trust the government not to get too big, if you trust the government not to intrude, then you really ought to believe every word of that DWP statement. In a moment, the North-South divide appears to have opened up in a way that is far bigger than I think any of us could imagine. This is about the number of children in the north of England going into care, and I worry that it shows us genuine societal breakdown. On Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 till 11 p.m., the infamous TikTok prankster Mizzy is live in the studio after a sobering stretch behind bars. Mizzy says he's a reformed character. Can we believe him? Plus, I've got exclusive footage of what illegal migrants on the Bibby Stockholm barge are really up to. And should the bank accounts of benefit claimers be monitored? Is it ever OK to smack a child? Reform UK MP Lee Anderson gives his irrepressible takes. Don't miss Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m. Be there. Britain's Newsroom. Weekday mornings from 9.30. Is it OK to call people fat? I won't call Bev fat, because she isn't. She <laughs> won't call me fat, because I'm not. But the fitness fanatic, Derek Evans, you might know him better as 90s icon, Mr Motivator, recently he's told a podcast, diabetes have gone through the roof. And you should be able to call people fat. Well, he joins us now. Good morning, Derek. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see you. So I think what you're getting you. at is this idea that we've become so polite about weight that we're ignoring the elephant in the room. Um, if you'll forgive the <laughs> forgive the phraseology there, and actually sure. sometimes you've got to be cruel to be kind. Well, actually, you know, this has been taken out of all context. I actually didn't say you're entitled to call people fat. What I did say is that in the 80s and 90s, I remember the way I got into television, there was a gentleman walking at reception while I was waiting for the people I was training. And for some reason, I got up and I prodded them in the belly. And I said to him, you need to deal with that. That was fat. We have a nation where obesity, diabetes is killing every one of us. Mm. And unless we take responsibility for our health, rather than waiting for government to do this, government to do that, it is our responsibility, right, to look after our independence and our health. And as we get older, it's even more critical, right? And that's why I'm here as an example saying to you, listen, I'm 71 years of age and movement is medicine. And you can't sit around watching television and not going out to the gym or wherever, you will never ever be able to look after your family and everything you've worked for, you will lose it. I've never seen a hearse, uh, sorry, a deposit account behind a hearse. Mm. I've ne no matter what you work for, the most important thing you can do with your life is every hour, do something active. Every hour. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 
2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Have a think about these numbers. One in every 52 children in Blackpool is in care. One in every 63 children in Hartlepool is in care. One in every 278 is in care in Hertfordshire and one in every 256 in Buckinghamshire is in care. So we have a massive north-south divide in terms of the number of children going into care. The fact that in Blackpool it's around about 2% clearly is very, very alarming. Now, I'll be the first to say this is not a subject about which I know very much, but I'm keen to find out what is happening in the north of England. Is this a direct result of increased poverty or does it reflect a bigger, scarier societal breakdown? Well, joining me first is Professor Kate Pickett, Academic Director of, the, of Health Equality North. Uh, Kate, I can scarcely believe these numbers. What is going on? Well, I'm glad you're shocked and thanks for having me on. This is something we really need to be talking about. We know that some of this reason is for exactly what you said. It is due to rising poverty. Yeah. So 28% of England's children live in the north, but it's 36% of its population of children in care. So there's definitely a serious problem here that we need to be thinking about. Yeah. And we know that in the five years between 2015 and 2020, rising poverty rates led to an additional 10,000 children going into care. But I also want to point out that the child care population in the north isn't just northern kids. We do see children moved from the south to the north into care because it's cheaper in the north. Yeah, I mean, that's the same argument that gets used for asylum seekers. Things are cheaper in the North. OK, so maybe that does skew the figures ever. Not much. So, not much. Not OK. Much. But, but, but are we saying that poverty is the main reason? Or is it family breakdown? Is it adult drug dependency? Is it abuse of children? I mean, I'm sure there's a whole catalogue of reasons. Can we, can we pin down one area, you know, other well, than just... People being poor. Yes. We can certainly pin down poverty as a root cause of all those other causes that you're talking about. So poverty as a cause of the causes. So, yes, some children are taken into care because of um, drug or addiction problems that their parents have, um, family breakdown, all sorts of other reasons. But poverty is a root cause of all of those things. Right. And no prospect of that turning around in, in, in short order. So this is clearly a massive burden on councils all over the north of England. The economic cost of this must be simply enormous. Yes, they're staggering. And of course, it always costs more to cure than it does to prevent. So we've got local authorities with shrinking budgets, but they've got to spend money on children in care because that's a statutory requirement. They have to take care of children but they yeah. have less and less money with which to do that, increasing number of children, and all of that money could be better spent on prevention, on supporting families so they didn't get to that point in the first place. OK. Professor Kate Pickett, thank you for coming on and telling us just how bleak the situation is. I'm also joined down the line by Dr Bernard Gallagher, independent child protection researcher. Bernard, I just spoke to Kate briefly there. Um, same with you. What on earth is going on? And she talked about prevention. What can we do? We can do a lot. Um, I think it's important to say, first of all, though, that I've been studying child protection for about 35 years, and I've never come across a case of a child being taken into care because it's poor. Um, children are taken into care 
uh, invariably because of their parents' severe psychosocial problems. Those problems sometimes manifest in drug misuse, domestic abuse, mental health problems. That makes those parents unwilling or unable to care for their children. That's why their children are taken taken into care, but they are only taken into care in the most extreme circumstances. Yeah. And as I say, I've never came across a case of a child being taken into care because of poverty. No, the argument, I guess, is that poverty can lead to other social problems, but I absolutely get, Bernard, but what poverty you're doesn't saying. lead to the severity of problems that children experience. What we're talking about primarily here is severe abuse and neglect. Poverty does not cause severe abuse and neglect, which leads to children being taken into care. It's, no. as I say, mental health problems, domestic violence and substance misuse. It's parents' profound psychosocial problems that leads to ch their children being taken into care. Now, in terms of what we can do about, I mean, about these severe cases, but also child abuse and neglect cases more generally. I think what we desperately need to do is invest much more in those agencies that are working to prevent these problems. And since the onset of austerity in 2010, we've lost something like a third of health visitors, a third of our school nurses, hundreds of children's centres have closed, which was designed primarily to help the most deprived and vulnerable families in society. And just finally, the police now don't have enough resources whereby they can um, fully investigate all the digital devices they seize in suspected child sex abuse cases. And when they aren't in um, sort of examining all those digital devices, it means that victims of child sexual abuse are going undetected. So we mm. desperately need, mm. as, as your previous speaker said, we desperately yeah. need to invest more I, I, in those services Bernard, to prevent these Bernard, cases. The money we spend as a nation on health and care goes up and up and up, uh, and yet there seems to be a, a, a totally insatiable demand. I wonder, perhaps sometimes, whether we're spending the money in the right places. But the places. problem is the number of children are going up, and I think also, talking more generally, we are becoming more aware of child protection-related issues, such as uh, female genital mutilation, forced yep. marriages, child yep. exploitation, internet abuse, problems we didn't know about before, or sometimes problems we chose to turn a blind eye to. So now, mm. thankfully, we should be pleased that we are addressing this is these issues. Now, it is expensive to address these issues, but again, as your previous speaker said, it's much better we spend the money now in either preventing the problems or reducing yep. their severity than trying to pick up the pieces later. Afterwards. Bernard Gallagher, thank you very much indeed. And folks at home and in your cars, as I say, this is not a subject I know very much about. Interesting to get those opinions. Particularly interesting uh, when Bernard there said that poverty of itself isn't a reason for children going into care, but it is the psychological, deep psychological problems being suffered by parents. And, and I just wonder, I wonder what percentage of this is down to drug use. I bet it's pretty, or, or misuse of alcohol or whatever else it may be. I bet it's pretty high. Well, I'm joined in the studio by Jacob rees -Mogg. Jacob, what have, you got, what have you got coming up? Well, we're going to be talking about the House of Lords again. Yeah. As it carries so what's on. going to happen tonight? Well, there's one vote already, um, which I'm sure has already been reported, that the government has lost. So it'll definitely be back. This is extraordinary because the House of Lords is really pushing the Constitution I to its limits. It. You did, yes. And, and um, I've, all I was saying at the time was that if they followed the con conventions, yeah. it would get through, but they've decided not to. Yeah. And that's quite serious. Very, very interesting. But at least we have free speech in Parliament. Well, so we... far, which you don't. <laughs> do you got caught out by the Brussels Gestapo? Yeah, but we won! You won, A yes. huge victory for free speech, which and is good the, news. And the mayor was a hard-left mayor who just didn't agree with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in fact, basically, in Belgium, uh, in Brussels, no alternative views allowed. And you're sure he's not on your staff? Because he got you so much favour. I know. I I it must be your agent. I know. Whether it's the bank cancelling me or those people, they, they all seem to do me a huge favour. Let's have a look with Alex Deacon and see, are the April showers going to improve? Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. 
Time for your latest weather update from the Met Office here on GB News. Good evening. Temperatures dropping away tonight. It's going to be a cold start tomorrow. Much of the south will stay fine, but further north, some rain and cloud moving in, thanks to this little area of low pressure that's drifting south. Ahead of that, we've had a couple of weather fronts bringing some rain today, particularly for Northern Ireland. That's now spreading south across parts of Pembrokeshire, Devon and Cornwall, but clearing through this evening. Further showers across eastern England, they'll steadily fade as well. And where we've got the clear skies, southern Scotland, northwest England, Wales, a hint of blue on the chart, suggesting there will be a frost, certainly in the countryside. Most towns and cities just about staying above freezing, but certainly a, a chilly start to Thursday. For many, a bright, sunny start. There could be some showers early on across Kent. They should fade, but rain will creep into uh, the highlands of Scotland, the Western Isles first thing, and that'll spread across most of Scotland by lunchtime. Parts of the north and east of Northern Ireland seeing some rain, and through the afternoon, turning damp over Northern England and North Wales. But much of the south will stay dry and bright. We could reach 15 in London, a brighter day across East Anglia. Cooler further north with the winds picking up and those brisk winds, then a feature of the weather on Friday as well. Friday broadly speaking, a mixture of sunshine and showers, a duller day across the southeast and a, a much wetter day across East Anglia compared to tomorrow. Feeling chilly again with that wind, much of Northern Ireland, Scotland having a drier day, uh, but still on the fresh side, 8 to 14 degrees. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a 